Hello and welcome to the lecture on game mechanics. Here is a book recommended for this topic. And I also have a short disclaimer to read all images and particularly game screenshots are used to illustrate the concepts discussed here and was considered fair use. No game character was harmed in the making of these lecture slides as well as the video material. As a warm up, I also have a visualization for you showing the behavior of a game character in the form of a finite state machine for you to contemplate. So no comment. Moving on to the definition of what we understand as game mechanics, rules, processes, and data at the heart of the game, which uh, define how the game progresses, what happens when, and also victory and defeat conditions. Please keep in mind the definition of the game. This, uh, this is the meaningful play with rules and victory conditions. So mechanics uh, encompasses all this. Uh, the goal is to make the game enjoyable, uh, challenging, and uh, balanced. Uh, but uh, game mechanics, game rules, uh, what is actually the difference? And uh, I will use this uh, automotive metaphor here. Uh, if you drive a car, you have an engine. Uh, you don't actually need to know how the engine works. You don't even need to know what kind of an engine you have. You don't have to be a car mechanic in order to drive the car. You don't mind, all right? Um, what you mind is uh, this part, which is your user interface, something that you have to understand, you have to know uh, what it means, uh, because this is how you communicate with the engine. Um, and then what's uh, absolutely important are all these rules. So this funny picture here is a real world section of a road somewhere in Poland. Uh, yes, this is not a fair of um, traffic signs, it's a segment of a real world road. Um, and uh, the other picture shows another set of rules. This is a uh, planning map or diagram showing the traffic uh, organization in some portion of a town. So you can see here several different uh, layers starting from something that is hidden. And indeed, if you play a game, you don't need to understand all the behind the scenes uh, uh, pieces and the parts. Uh, what you need to know is uh, the rules of the game and uh, how to apply these rules uh, in order to play the game. Uh, if you think about uh, the Monopoly of a most classic board game, uh, the rules in Monopoly, so this side of the screen, uh, the rules in Monopoly are easily fit in a single A4 page, maybe two. Uh, they aren't very simple, but they are also not very, very complex. But the game mechanics for Monopoly is much deeper because we, these are all these elements that you can buy and sell all the prices, all the locations, all even the texts printed on the cards that you are using during the game. That's all the game mechanics. And of course, the player doesn't need to know all aspects, all details of the mechanics. That, that's something that a game designer has to know. And the game designer will have to communicate this game mechanics to the game developer in order to implement, to create the game. But the player just needs to know the game rules, or does he? In case of uh, computer games, you would usually start the game without even knowing the game rules, because uh, computer games have a capacity to teach a player the game rules. There are tutorial levels, there are all kinds of other tools that make it possible to for, for the player to learn 
about the game rules uh, and um, uh, moreover uh, the player will only know the part of the rules that are necessary for him or her to play the game at a given moment all right so game mechanics is something much broader and much deeper than just the game rules and that's the difference between the two terms now moving on to the objectives of thinking about game mechanics uh, at the stage of game design and at the same time the objectives of this lecture session uh, is to know how to design and balance the game before you write a single line of code um, particularly the next uh, lecture in this uh, in this series will be about balancing games Today we will mostly concentrate on various aspects of uh, mechanics, but without particular look into how to balance the game. So how to make it not too difficult, not too easy, but just right. Uh, also, we will look into some uh, ways of visualizing the internal economy for documentation purposes, for prototyping, for simulation. Uh, this visualization part is not particularly covered in this uh, lecture recording now, uh, but on Wednesday when we meet, uh, or perhaps we met face to face, um, this uh, visualization is planned or has been hopefully demonstrated uh, to you directly. And uh, also we will look into various aspects of the games and particularly the progressive and the emergent aspect of the games and understand these aspects. What's out of the scope today? Uh, we will not discuss graphical and art design. We will not discuss programming aspects of the game mechanics. And we will not discuss AI, even if we could, because AI is a very substantial part of uh, game mechanics, but it's out of the scope of this uh, uh, lecture session. And one more thing about the terminology, uh, we are happy to use uh, the term mechanics, which is uh, which sounds like a plural, uh, to describe exactly what I said it is uh, uh, rules and uh, processes and data everything that makes the game uh, behave as as it does so that's the game mechanics uh, unfortunately there is another meaning for the same word and um, even if i would love to use either a singular form for this mechanic or perhaps more adequate mechanism uh, the practical point is that uh, most people will just call it mechanics, perhaps as a real plural form of uh, mechanic. But anyway, the word mechanics, even if we would really love to, to use a separate term, has a dual meaning. So besides what I just told, mechanics in a game is simply something that the player interacts with, such as moving platforms, opening and closing doors, uh, rope swings, slingshots, and so on. Uh, by the way, there is some terminology here, not very complex, but it is a game design terminology. If a game mechanic, okay, and I'm uh, especially using the singular form, if a game mechanic uh, is uh, dangerous so it is like an electrified platform that can kill you a blaze jets of flame spike pits etc they will be called then hazards okay a hazard with an ai becomes an enemy and we also have power-ups collectibles um, and so on all right Now, once upon a time there were birds and these birds had eggs and uh, one day they've been attacked by pigs and pigs destroyed these eggs and made birds really, really, really angry. Of course, uh, this is the story behind the uh, one of the fame, most famous mobile games of all times, Angry Birds. 
And uh, this picture shows uh, the basic mechanics, which is very heavily uh, based on physics. Uh, there is a slingshot, there is a, a pig's house, and you have to destroy uh, the cows shooting pigs uh, you, from a slingshot. So uh, simple mechanics, uh, which has uh, no direct relation to the story. Okay, what I told you is a actually a complete story of the game, but this story doesn't affect the mechanics of the game in any way. Otherwise, that giving a pretext to to create a game uh, just like this. Um, this game is a very example of a ludologic function or ludologic theory of games. Um, I believe that this game still uh, requires a story, okay? If you didn't understand why you are shooting, um, actually without the, uh, even the title of this game gives you some hint about the story. Uh, perhaps you might think, what is this, this, this uh, um, red balls with with something uh, yellow in the front and very angry look angrily looking eye without the title of the game angry birds it couldn't couldn't be even so 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 obvious that these are birds okay birds oh some birds are very round but not all of them um but without this story it would be perhaps not such a big uh, enjoyment of playing this this game without understanding why you are you wh why you are destroying these houses but anyway the point is that uh, the story the narration of this game hardly affects the details of uh, of uh, uh, mechanics so actually mechanics of this game and the story behind this game are two separate things and the game uh, relates um, depends on uh, the mechanics much more heavy than on the narration. But of course, there are also uh, games following the narratologic uh, paradigm in gaming, uh, like, uh, for example, this one. But actually, in this action, something, something wrong happens. Something is not entirely right uh, about this particular example of uh, game mechanics. I think you are recognizing uh, what game it is. And uh, of course, this kind of blunders happens quite happen quite often, but it's. It's very funny. OK, moving on to types of mechanics, I'm not going to uh, discuss too much about it because this is uh, nearly a self-explaining uh, topic. So uh, here you have a list of five principal types of mechanics that you can use in games. Uh, physics, and you've seen a beautiful example of Angry Birds. Internal economy, which is such an important part of uh, many games that we will have a special section in this uh, uh, in this lecture about uh, game economy then we have progression mechanisms progression mechanisms are ideal to tell a story of the game to uh, introduce uh, a narration uh, but there are also games based on tactical maneuvering and games based on social interaction and here is a useful grid showing applications of these principal mechanics across a range of game genres. So, for example, uh, you can find physics as the dominating mechanics for action games or economy and tactical maneuvering for strategy games. A progression will be the primary uh, mechanics for role playing and adventure games and so on and so on. Uh, you can use this as a practical catalog of uh, primary and also secondary types of uh, mechanics useful for uh, many different types of of the games. Please note that uh, uh, your particular 
game design doesn't have to be exactly mapped into this grid, mostly because uh, good games rarely are within a single game genre. Uh, usually you will uh, like to combine several types of, of a game, making something that will uh, make your game standing out of the crowd. But um, nevertheless, as uh, thinking about classical applications, classical games, classical mechanics, this can be a helpful as a handy catalog or review of, of uh, important uh, mechanics for each of those uh, game genres. We have now concluded the introductory part of this uh, lecture and in the second stage of this lecture, I will be talking about two aspects of games, games of emergence and games of progression. This doesn't mean that these are two separate uh, species of games. Uh, usually uh, each concrete game title will uh, somehow combine the emergent and progressive uh, aspect and we will now look into it. So first, uh, games of emergence. According to Wikipedia, emergence is a process whereby larger entities, patterns and regularities arise from interactions among smaller or simpler entities that themselves do not exhibit such properties. So for example, uh, this larger entity or pattern may be snowflakes, which are very beautiful, but they are created by small frozen water, also known as ice crystals, that do not exhibit any kind of this uh, uh, beautiful look by themselves. And also we have a nest of termites uh, called the termitarium or from Spanish termitierra, uh, which is uh, created by small termites that do not individually exhibit too much intelligence, but working in a huge group they can create uh, absolutely amazing structures. So this is about simple parts that create complex systems. Behaviors of the system that cannot be directly derived from its uh, constituent parts. In uh, Angry Birds, this uh, emergent behavior comes from physics. Even a small misplacement of your finger on the uh, phone screen will create a huge discrepancy, a huge change in the trajectory of your uh, bird. Uh, so it's uh, actually very difficult to recreate a shot in uh, the same, ide ideally the same form. In Minecraft, emergency is derived from nearly limitless freedom and openness of the uh, world. You can easily consider the emergent aspect in many uh, other games uh, as well. 16 white pieces, 16 black pieces, 64 fields, simple rules easily fit on one page A4, number of possible game states exceeds number of atoms on Earth as counted by Shannon in 1950. What could be a more beautiful example of an emergent gameplay than chess? But I also will show you two simpler games, Tic-Tac-Toe, okay? A game that you played, um, I'm sure, many, many times, but I'm not so sure where, when it was the last time you played Tic-Tac-Toe, unless you have uh, very small children about, around you, uh, because uh, what happens? This game is quite amazing, quite um, quite um, exciting for very young children. Okay, very soon those children will learn entire tactics in the game. In the game, the game will become totally predictable and thus. Bowling. Okay, gameplay is played on three by three grid. Players take turns to occupy a square. A square can be occupied only once. The first player to occupy three squares in a row wins. 
And another game, Connect 4. The game is played on slightly bigger grid, not 3x3, three three, but 6x7. Uh, the other rules are quite similar with a few um, changes. Only the bottom most three square in each column can be occupied. The first player to occupy four squares in a row wins. Okay, so uh, this is a slightly different, uh, slightly different set of rules, slightly more complex uh, set of rules, but still it um, on the screen it takes nearly the same area than tic-tac-toe. So in terms of rules, Connect 4 is not particularly more complex. It is a bit, but not particularly. But it is such a completely different game. And we can display it on a diagram like this. So we have two axes here, complexity of the rules, complexity of the game. And you can see that uh, with uh, very simple rules, the game has no chance to be complex or engaging in any way. But then we have this zone here, which is uh, called barrier of complexity, in which uh, just a small change in making rules just a bit more complex will affect in a huge leap in complexity of the game. And uh, Connect 4 is somewhere here. And actually you should um, have as a goal to locate your complexity somewhere in this area, okay? Because the game rules here are complex, but not too complex. And the complexity of the game is nice. It, it, it allows the game to be engaging and not boring, fun, okay? Uh, note also that if you further develop the rules, making them even more complex, the gain in the complexity of the game or quality of gameplay is very questionable, okay? So uh, we could say that somewhere in this range, uh, the game is overcomplicated in terms of rules, which does not transfer into an interesting uh, gameplay. So this is the area we should target. Can the emergence be developed? Uh, well, of course it can. And an example is here. It's called Stephen Wolfram's Cellular Automaton. We have here eight simple graphical rules on the left-hand side and a pattern created by these rules on the right-hand side. How it works? Each uh, square here within this pattern is based on uh, the pattern of the three neighboring squares, one line above it. So for example, if a line above it is, let's say, black, white, white, then the uh, square just below uh, this pattern will be black. And this, uh, this pattern is started from uh, a single black square put here in the, in the very top. As you can imagine, there is a pattern white, black, white here. So white, black, white creates a black just immediately below. But there are also neighboring sides, neighboring squares. So for example, on the left, the pattern immediately above it of three consecutive rectangles is white, white, black. White, white, black is this rule, and this creates also a black square. Uh, there is also a position on the right, and uh, immediately above it, we have black, white, white. Black, white, white is here, and it's also a black, uh, a black square. Uh, looking at the line number three, so uh, the rectangle here, just above it, in the line above it, we have a pattern now black, black, black triple black creates a white and so on. This is the basic rule. And if it is applied for every square, we get this intricate, quite interesting, I think, pattern on the right. And this is another classical example, Conway's Game of Life. There are only two rules here. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors will survive. Otherwise, it will die either of loneliness or overcrowding. And uh, any dead cell 
with exactly three live neighbors will start to leave due to reproduction. And don't ask me why you need three neighbors to reproduce. That's just a rule. So let's have a try in this uh, simple life simulator. A single cell is not stable because it's too lonely. But a system of four cells will be stable because each cell has exactly three neighbors. So it's just stable. Another interesting system is here. It's called an oscillator because it goes oscillating through different phases. And this one will also be quite interesting. This pattern is called a, a beacon and I think you know why. But what's uh, really interesting are the patterns that have a potential to move across, like this one, called a glider. And another one called heavyweight spaceship. Here it is. However, for me, it more looks like a bird than a spaceship. And here you can enjoy a wider selection of life patterns, thanks to Wikipedia. Reynolds Boyd's uh, make one more example of emergent systems, quite important for us, because it is often used in games to simulate crowds or flocks. Each uh, individual here is governed by three rules, and it is important that these rules are only applied to its closest neighborhood, not to the whole flock. And these are separation, steer to avoid crowding local flock mates, alignment, steer towards the average heading of local flock mates, and cohesion, steer to move towards the average position or center of mass of local flock mates. And uh, here is a natural version of a flock of boys, uh, because sometimes you have to stop playing games and go out for nature. These are tens of thousands of oyster catchers and knots I filmed a few years ago in Snetishan, a belt reserve in northern Norfolk. Ecosystems are another example of an emergent system and a very well balanced one. This balance can be achieved thanks to something that is called a negative feedback loop. And it can be explained on the example of predators and prey. When there are many prey, the pred predators will find food very easily. The number will increase, however, the more predators means uh, fewer uh, prey the prey population will decrease. At some moment, there will be too many predators and the whole situation reverses. Now the predators won't find enough food and their population will decrease. Uh, with fewer predators, more prey will survive and uh, their population will rise again. This situation of uh, negative loop is quite popular in games. For example, in civilization, growing cities will lead to growing population that will demand more and more food. And eventually the city's size will be stabilized at a level in which the city can be supported by the terrain around it 
and the current level of technology. Apart from negative feedback, we also have, I think it's not a surprise, positive feedback. An example can be found in chess. If you take many pieces from your opponent, you may have the opponent weaker and weaker, and it will be even easier to take even more pieces after a time. These two feedback types, negative and positive feedback, with the stabilizing and destabilizing influence on the gameplay, are a very important aspect of the game economy, and we will look into this topic once again in the final part of this lecture when we discuss uh, in-game economies. Let's stay for a moment with uh, civilization as an example. Is it a game of emergence or progression? With its uh, economy built and the resources managed on the basis of maybe quite complicated, but um, uh, still well, very well defined uh, rules. Um, it's emergence. Okay. Uh, the gameplay uh, goes through a number of phases uh, from initial very quick, uh, very fast um, expansion when you have to acquire as much terrain as possible. Uh, then this expansion slows down, but you invest a lot and eventually you encounter your neighbors and the phase of conflict and conquer and uh, later technological race starts. Uh, but these phases, these phases are not anything that would be scripted, uh, specifically programmed, they are simply a consequence of the game rules. Um, and in these terms, these phases um, are also a aspect, an emergent aspect of this uh, gameplay. This game also has historical periods, uh, classical, medieval, renaissance, modern, and this is a very much different story here because these periods start from some arbitrary moments, uh, some arbitrary triggers that start periods, and this is a kind of an artificial addition uh, created by the game designer to provide a feel of progression in this game. Therefore, historical periods in this overall um, heavily emergent gameplay, historical periods are elements of a game of progression. Uh, this game also has so-called golden ages, so from time to time there is a 20 turn span of increased uh, production. Uh, they are scripted, so in these terms they are kind of uh, another aspect of uh, game of progression. On the other hand, uh, they are also the, particularly the trigger that starts a golden age. Uh, it's also based on game rules, and in this case, the golden ages can be identified as something on the borderline or overlap between the game of emergence and the game of progression. But if you have, if we have uh, identified something of a game of progression in civilization. Maybe it's time to move on to our next topic, games of progression. And uh, the picture showed here is, of course, uh, Half-Life 2. The main character arrives to the game, to the station by train. But as someone beautifully told about this game, he remains on the rails all the time. Half-Life 2 is one of the leading examples of so-called railroading. So the player is led very, very specifically from event to event, from location to location. Um, and uh, this is how the progression is uh, built in this game. You, of course, have some uh, freedom, which is an element of emergence in this game as well. But uh, the most characteristic aspect of Half-Life is its progression. And, of course, this progression is 
built in to provide the basis to tell a story. Uh, this is a game which has a very, very strong and actually very good uh, game story. It's my one of my favorite uh, game based stories. Um, yeah, and uh, we all the time have a kind of a balance between uh, this progression and emergence. So, uh, for example, when the player, the hero, uh, leaves the railway station in the uh, initial stage, initial chapter of the game, he enters the city. And it seems that uh, there is a total freedom. You can go wherever you want. Um, you can visit many different places. There is a number of streets to, to explore, a big square. But eventually you have to find one particular place because there is a railroad there to the next chapter of the game. And finding something quite often unlocks a, another stage, another chapter in the game. So one of the most uh, powerful elements on which games of progression are built is the mechanics of a trigger and a lock, or a key and a lock. Basically, games of progression are usually about games of uh, levels. And let's have a look at some uh, typical, some classical mappings of uh, game levels. Let's start from something like this. A player I will switch to a laser pointer, maybe. A player starts a game, kills some enemies, then kills some more enemies, then kills even more enemies, finds a sword, kills one more enemy, and eventually encounters the boss. And this is why he needed the sword, because the boss can only be won with the sword. But this is a very linear uh, map. It's uh, not very exciting. You don't have too many choices. And uh, it is a very well defined progression of the levels, but there is zero of emergence, zero of uh, any options. And therefore, we can imagine something slightly different. And in uh, this case, on the left, we enter the game, uh, find some uh, enemies, uh, kill even more enemies. But then we have a door. To open this door, you have to collect a key. So we have a key or trigger and lock system. After unlocking the door, you can collect uh, the sword, kill more enemies, encounter the boss. Um, this is still very linear, but uh, this level on the right here, it's nearly the equivalent, but it's already a little bit more interesting because when you enter the game, you have two different routes. One route is blocked with the locked door and you can go the other way to find the key, then go back to this to this place which we can call a hub, a game, game hub, and from this hub we will again attack the door. Now, now with the key, the door can be opened, find a sword, kill enemies, encounter the boss. Done. Another classic composition is uh, even uh, more defined, more, better expressed uh, mechanics of uh, what we could call mechanics of hub and spoke. So we start here, we can go left or from the point of view of the player, it will be right, find one key, go left, find another key, left of course again from the point of view of the, of the player coming from here. And the door that can open the route to the next part of the game needs both keys to be unlocked. So if you, when you collect uh, both keys, you can unlock the door, find uh, the sword, kill enemies, and counter the boss. Done. A slight difference, uh, there are two different doors. Two different doors. Uh, you have to find a key. Uh, with this key, you can open one door, find a sword, then go back, 
open another door and encounter the boss. But uh, this composition has one big flaw. What if uh, you choose to open this door first and you encounter the boss without the chance to uh, get a sword before? Um, so this is not a very good game design because um, actually opening this door first is a kind of a trap. So it's uh, it's unfair to the player. Therefore, we can have a system like this. Again, we have two different doors, but the boss is hidden behind even the third door. And to find the key to the third door, you have to navigate to this room you can find uh, the sword here but you can also find the actual final key and only now you can go back open the third door and counter the boss done and uh, one more i think it's a uh, final layout here just a small modification you can access all the three doors uh, directly from the, the entrance hub, uh, but you have to find one key here only to open this door and this door. Inside you have to collect two keys to open the boss door. At this time you must encounter uh, your sword, you must find your sword, you will come to, the, to meet the boss uh, well prepared with the sword. More or less, this covers uh, most of the classical, typical um, level maps. And the example of such a map is uh, here, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, and uh, this level is the Forest Temple. You have a map on the left, and map a map is one good way to visualize the structure of the game. So when you create your game design documents, it's good to think about creating a map just like this, right? The other way of uh, providing the same information in uh, maybe less visually appealing way, uh, but more formal and in some cases easier to, uh, to analyze is to provide a graph of a game. And indeed, looking at this graph, you can easily find a few things. So first of all, this is very much a, a game based on the paradigm of a hub and a spoke. So you have a hub here. From this hub, you have one, two, three, four different routes. And uh, it doesn't matter which route you, you, you take first. The game will always start with uh, freeing a monkey, then fighting a spider. The spider is, uh, I think it is here on this map, okay. Uh, and after you won the spider, which is the first major enemy in the level, you can either go here, find small key, free a monkey, or use a bombing, find a small key, free a monkey, use bombing, find small key, free a, free a monkey. Uh, basically, uh, all these routes, so we have a number of parallel routes, and parallel routes in the graph are something that uh, that is very characteristic to the hub and spoke type of the game, game level design, sorry. Um, all these choices that you make will always sooner or later take you to a cross gap phase here because to cross the gap you have first of all to free all four monkeys so one monkey two three and this is the fourth monkey you need four monkeys to cross the gap um, so this means that first of all on one hand your decisions made here which way to go are uh, meaningless because sooner or later you have to go through all the three or four routes and uh, it doesn't matter really which one you take as the first but at least it gives uh, the player impression of freedom okay and uh, apart from this impression of freedom it can also play a very practical role in the game uh, because uh, you can go one route 
then resign because it's uh, too difficult, come back to the hub, try another way, try another way, and when you master the game so that you finish one route of free a monkey in this case, you can go back and try with the more difficult paths, pathways, perhaps with more experience, more skills. Okay, so that's a, a very useful level architecture. If you look at this map here, you can notice that uh, there is a lot of hubs here, smaller and larger. And all this structure is based on multiple parallel routes, which will all eventually lead to the same place, fight the level boss. And this led us to the moment when after 45 minutes and covering both emergent and progressive aspect of the games, we are now left with just one final chapter of this lecture, the game economy. But this, after the break, all in a separate recording. Thank you.